Okay, the trouble with puddle thinking. Mm -hmm. So this week we want to touch on something which is seemingly controversial in astronomy, and this is this notion of the anthropic principle. As it's actually kind of used in the astronomy literature, as, as scientists actually who, who use it, try to use it, it it's simply saying uh, we are life forms, we are in the universe, we require certain conditions in order for us to exist at all. So as we look at our surroundings, given that we exist... We shouldn't be we shouldn't be surprised that we see the kind of surroundings that we need in order to exist. That sounds a bit weird and circular. It sounds a bit garbled, actually. Yeah. But <laughs> Maybe we should. <laughs> it, it's basically look in astronomy and in cosmology, especially. We're always inside the system we're trying to study. Okay. So if you're a biologist looking at a horse, right? The horse is over there, and you can you can set up cameras and just monitor the horse uh, w without doing too much to affect it but it it's not it's not even the case that that you know whenever we look at something we kind of affect it in some way or another it, it's we're part of the universe the before we observe the universe the universe made us yeah okay so before we get into the controversy of course a lot of, a lot of words have been written about yep. the anthropic principle uh, and I think some of the the most quoted ones are actually by well-known writer Douglas Adams. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to just uh, recite his little bit of text on this. Go for it. This is rather as if you imagine a puddle waking up one morning and thinking. This is an interesting world I find myself in. An interesting hole I find myself in. Fits me rather neatly, doesn't it? In fact, it fits me staggeringly well. It must have been made to have me in it. This is such a powerful idea that as the sun rises in the sky and the air heats up, and as, gradually, the puddle gets smaller and smaller, frantically hanging on to the notion that everything's going to be alright because the world was meant to have him in it, was built to have him in it. So the moment he disappears catches him rather by surprise. I think this may be something we need to be on the watch out for. So Douglas said that in A Salmon of Doubt. And of course, it portrays this idea of, again, as you mentioned, we should not be surprised to find ourselves in a universe that allows us to be here. And um, allows us, of course, I mean the physical processes and the conditions, etc., are right for intelligent life to exist on this rocky planet near a fairly typical star. Well, let, me, let me give an example which might be useful. I mean, we're, we're astronomers, and when you're an astronomer, you spend an awful lot of time worrying about selection effects. And it's simply the thing that what you see when you look through your telescope, so to speak, uh, is is not just uh, doesn't just depend on what's out there, but also what your telescope is, what kind of telescope is, where you pointed it, why you decided to point it that way, and those sorts of things. And whenever you're doing cosmology, you have to worry about not just the thing you're looking at, the universe, but the thing you're looking with, which is not just I have to worry about how my eyes are put together and how my telescope's put together. But if we're thinking about the history of the universe and our place in it and why it might have the features it has, we, we need to worry about the, the process that made me and the Earth and why we're in this particular place rather than some other place. And the anthropic principle in its sort of original form, uh, thanks to, to Brandon Carter in 1973, was simply that observation. Our place in the universe, in particular the time that we observe the universe from, is not just some random time. It's not just some time that we've chosen. It's not anything written into the laws of nature. It's, it's a function of when, did, when does the universe make the kind of thing, like us, that can watch a universe happen. So this is built on um, some thoughts by uh, Robert Dickey mm -hmm. uh, in the 1960s that uh, we shouldn't be su surprised to find ourselves here you know, a number of billion years after the Big Bang because you need that sort of period for stars to process hydrogen and helium into heavier elements. Without those heavier elements, you couldn't have planets. And without planets, you couldn't have people, blah, 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 blah. So there's a, a chain there that, you know, we, we would be very surprised to find ourselves in the first one second of the universe, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so why is it controversial? It's, it, I mean, it seems to make sense, doesn't it? Well, there's a couple of reasons why it's controversial. One of them is that the term anthropic principle, which Carter had defined to be this nice, just this selection effect thing, kind of 
broke out <laughs> and other people started using the same word to describe different ideas. Okay. So in particular, in 1986, there was a very famous book called The Anthropic Cosmological Principle by uh, Barrow and Tipler, two very well-known um, physicists. And when they def defined something called the weak anthropic principle, that basically agreed with what Carter said. They combined his two principles into one, but that was still it was still fairly uncontroversial. So remind us what what Carter said. Okay, so Carter was basically what we've been saying so far. You've just got to take into account the fact that that you're in the system, right? Uh, what you see in the universe depends on what the universe has to do to make you in order for you to see the universe. Um, Carter then talked about the strong anthrop, what he called the strong anthropic principle. This is Carter saying, given that I'm here. There must be something that happened to make me here. Okay, and that's all it means by it. It's, it's a bit like saying there's frost on the ground, so it must have been cold last night. It's not saying that the frost caused the coldness. But when Barrow and Tipler, they put together something they call the strong anthropic principle, they've left Carter behind and they're now saying things like maybe there's some deep metaphysical principle or some external designer or some deep reason by by which our existence in some sense causes the universe to have the right properties, like the frost causing the cold. It's, it seems to have things backwards. Mm -hmm. But those ideas, whether they're right or wrong, are obviously more speculative, obviously for some people completely out of bounds, but now they're all marching under this header of the anthropic principle. And so the whole thing, including the uncontroversial bit that Carter had, now gets a bad reputation. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, there's now other people think, hey, let's just join in and, and define other things to be anthropic principles. So, so Barrow and Tipler talk about the final anthropic principle, that there must be, it's inevitable that you will get life, information processing life. And more than that, once it, uh, once it arises, it, it can never die out. And they have reasons for saying why that might happen. Yes. And they're... Yeah, they're pretty speculative, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. um, and then John Wheeler says uh, he's got his participatory anthropic principle, which is it has to do with how he interpreted quantum mechanics, where you know, the he said he he was of the view that it's the observation that sort of creates reality, and he sort of has this picture of maybe the whole universe is like that. So we really do make a universe yeah. in a very literal sense. Now, the point. Uh, we want to make is you know we could pull those ideas apart and show why they're slightly bonkers but the point is they're all for some stupid reason the wrong reasons they all got given this name anthropic principle and so they all their whole enterprise got a bad reputation and one of the key things that that um you know gets people upset excited is the anthropic that, yes. that is around yeah, people, yeah, yeah, that somehow yeah. people are central to the universe. We've we've spoken a little bit about this before, about um, the notion that uh, over the course of history, essentially there's been this demotion, but historically, of course, it's more it's messier than that. Hmm. Demotion of, of people to be on a planet around a typical star in a typical galaxy, etc. But in reality, the anthropic principle is not about people people mm. i mean one of the things that um uh, I, I i personally like the story of is uh, the work that fred hoyle did mm. in understanding the way that the nucleus of carbon works and he realized that there had to be this particular property that the carbon resonance that allowed stars to efficiently process lighter elements into carbon mm. and his notion was well there's plenty of carbon in the universe therefore um the way we understood stars at the time, they, you couldn't quite see how stars could produce that much carbon. Therefore, there must be this extra sort of route that carbon could be made. And when people tested it, it was there. What he didn't say is because there are people in the universe, stars must be able to do, yes. uh, do this processing into carbon. We're a consequence of the fact that there is carbon in the mm. universe because we, we make use of it. Mm. So the anthropic, as in around people, around man, I think is a misnomer uh, and in reality, it's, you know, the fact that we have complexity in the universe yeah. and what allows that complexity to be there because we are basically a representation of that complexity. So Carter was the one, Brandon Carter was the one who coined the term anthropic principle. And I think almost immediately 
uh, regretted it. Yeah, it he must have, have gone so bio friendly. Yeah, or something. he must have gone, and I will call this anthropic principle. Oh no, 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 no! But somebody heard him, right? So <laughs> no, wait, too late. Oh dear. Um, so that gives the wrong impression. The other part of this is that that if you think about the anthropic principle and thinking about how it's used, basically as kind of a uh, just a selection effect, it's 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 a tautology but a useful one. Um, if we just think that that's all there is to it, and a lot of people who sort of quote Douglas Adams at us think that it's just all puddle thinking, that's all there is to it, they uh, miss this deeper puzzle. I, I'd just like to point out, sometimes people quote Douglas Adams to you and then basically walk away because they've won the argument. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Boom, it's mic drop. This, yeah, it's this, this smackdown, this is all there is to it. Yeah. Uh, the thing that they're missing, I mean, it's alluded to actually in, Doug, in Adams's quote that... The, the puddle says, hey, this hole fits me really well. And there's, a, there's something that that's supposed to represent about our universe, which is not the anthropic principle, okay? That's that specific thing. Given we're here, our, our environment will support, will support us because otherwise we wouldn't be here. There's something called the fine-tuning of the universe for life, and that's different. It's a different thing. Sometimes people um, confuse the two. Fine tuning is 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 about okay. What does a universe need to do in the first place in order for life to exist? And is there anything uh, about that which seems to be peculiar or rare or those sorts of things? So we could sort of do a test run of other universes. Let's take our universe, but there are these fundamental properties like how much does an electron weigh, and like you said, you know. What's happening inside of carbon atoms? Well, that's not fundamental, but we can go back to the, the basic related things. related to fundamental. It's related to fundamental things. We find that, and this is fine-tuning, very small changes in some of the fundamental constants have a dramatic effect on the universe, and in particular, its effect to support uh, the kind of complexity that life needs. It's not that we can predict all the way to, you know, we're modelling little people and that sort of thing. But there's some basics that life seems to need, like atoms that stick to each other and a universe that will form structure at all. Um, you know, a periodic table would be nice at all. And what we end up with is in a, in a lot of these universes, a small change to these numbers. Just take that dial and just give it a tiny little change. Um, you end up with a universe in which uh, you get uh, no complexity at all. Uh, or very, very limited forms of complexity. So you won't have a periodic table, you'll just have you know, hydrogen. And it'll make a hydrogen molecule, but that's about the, the most complex molecule that you can make. Okay. And so that's, that's fine-tuning. And what that suggests is the question, not given that I'm here, why do I see these conditions? But why does a universe that supports life exist at all? Yeah. And that's the kind of thing where unless you're you're with Wheeler and doing some sort of participatory anthropic principle, although don't call it that, for heaven's sake. Unless you're doing something really, uh, you know, metaphysical and weird, that's not the thing that is answered by because we're here. Like, it, unless you've got a very weird picture of the world, w the universe isn't here because we're here. We're here because the universe is here. And we're here in this universe because it has these properties. So why does it have these rather than some of the other ones? So the real sort of insight that people should take away from puddle thinking is not that there's a puddle that fits a hole, but the fact that there's a puddle that exists in the first place and a hole that exists in the first mm. place for it to fit in. In a different universe, they just couldn't happen. Right. I think, for me, here's the problem with puddle thinking. The puddles notice a coincidence, right? The shape of the puddle, the shape of the hole. Oh, they're very similar, okay? Um, what the puddle doesn't seem to know is that that the puddle is actually a liquid, right? And so given gravity that pushes it down, it will fill any hole that it's put in. So if you took the, the, the water of the puddle and you put it in a different hole, it would fill that hole as well. That's exactly where, this, uh, where it breaks down for life, right? Life is not a, fl a fluid in that sense. Okay. You, Although life does involve a lot of fluids. It does involve a lot of fluids where whatever percent water and all that sort of thing. In that way, you, you, can't, you, you can't take us and stick us in any old universe and we'll survive. But more generally, you can't make any sort of interesting complexity in just any old universe. You can't just... Any, any old hole will do, but any old... Sorry, yeah, any old hole will do for the puzzle, puddle, 
any old universe will not do for life. That is what's wrong with this thing. There's yeah. The coincidence between life and the properties of our universe is a real coincidence that didn't have to be the case unless, and feel free to go with this, unless you've got some participatory, quantum, metaphysical, whatever idea that's, that, that actually will align these two. Okay. Well, look, we've spoken a lot today. I'm sure this video is not going to be the last uh, on this topic. <laughs> I'm sure we will still get puddle mic dropped in the future, but clearly it's a deeper question and a, a deeper principle than most people appreciate.